You may be seated. Uh, praise the Lord. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, good to see everyone. Hey, um, if you have a Bible, why don't you take it out and meet me in the book of Ruth. And as we're doing that, first of all, kiddos, you are excused to kids' ministry. Um, at five and under, and also if you are in Ignite, which is fifth through eighth grade, Jensen, uh, the best looking man in here with frosted tips and mustached out, he is the one you follow, that is the way that you go. So all kids in junior high, you are dismissed. And the waves of people go across. All right. Hey, as we uh, dive into God's word this morning, uh, let me first of all give us just a couple announcements of these next couple weeks. A um, couple announcements. First of all, um, you may know this, but a few weeks ago, by the way, thank you for being flexible and joining us outside. Reason we are outside uh, so early this summer is a few weeks ago, uh, the waters burst through the walls of the pool and water kind of flowed all throughout the event center, washed it all out, and they're making all things new. And so... Uh, and so, by the way, um, I laugh at that, but, but many of us have been praying that that physical reality would be a spiritual reality, like, like in our church, in our nation, like God, break through, wash it out, clean it out, make it all new. Uh, that's what we're praying. We're asking the Lord. And so, but anyways, uh, apparently next week, they are going to be done with that. Next week, uh, there's actually a swim meet out here. So we are back to normal church inside next week at 9 and 1045, okay? Thanks for being flexible. We just, if you've been part of this church for a long time, we meet everywhere. It doesn't, it's not about the building. It never has been. Okay, hey, second announcement is this. Uh, June 20th, um, we are going to have an evening of extended worship and prayer and just encountering the Lord. Um, at the end of each service here, we always close the service and we're like, hey, come on up and get prayer, and let's worship, and let's go after the Lord together. And we've just heard the feedback over and over. Gosh, could we just do that for longer, extended times? So we're, we're going to kind of create that rhythm here that every once in a while we're going to have this bold encounter, go after the heart of the Father night. So June 20th, 6 p.m., go ahead and put that in your calendar. All right? Everybody good? Book of Ruth. Uh, today... Um, we are going to finish an amazing story. Okay, if you've been with us, we have been talking about a love story, a beautiful story that could have only been, honestly, written by God. And it's a story that starts in great heartache, and it ends with just amazing hope, okay? And today, we are going to finish it. I'm going to give us, if you haven't been here, uh, good news, I'm going to give us sort of a runway where I review a lot of the big story and then we're going to land in chapter 4 today, and we're going to finish it, okay? And then we're going to ask some questions that we'd love to ask here. Questions like, what does this reveal about God? Like, what does it show us about the heart of God, and how shall we then live? Like, what does this reveal about us? How do we respond to this story, okay? So you ready? Thank you. Got one amen. Ruth. We're going to be in chapter 4, but let's start in chapter 1, and let's just kind of longly review this whole story. Okay, chapter 1, Book of Ruth. Um, it starts out and says, if you remember, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. If you want to put a title over this entire chapter, just write the word heartache, okay? Everything about this chapter is just Heartache, okay? Starts out when the judges ruled. And if you remember, if you were to flip one page to your left to the book of Judges, it ends that book saying, basically, in the days that the judges ruled, there was no king and everybody did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone was like, you do your truth, I'll do my truth, let's just do whatever we think is good. Does that sound familiar? I think so. It was bad, dark, horrible, discipline of God. Everybody turned away from God, and there was a famine in the land, okay? And the book of Ruth begins with a man and his family making a terrible decision, okay? 
If you remember Ruth chapter 1, there was a famine in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. There was no bread in the house of bread. And a man named Elimelech, whose name means my God is my king, did not live out his name. Instead of saying, God, you're my king, we're going to like repent and turn and trust you and cling to you in this moment. He's like, there is no bread. I guess we got to do it our own way. And he took his wife, whose name was Naomi, which means the pleasant one, and he took Naomi and Malon and Kilion and said, we are out of here, we're going to Moab. And if you remember Moab, like like biblically Moab, was this evil, sinful, you name the sin, they did it in Moab. Everything was dark and awful in Moab. And he's like, I'm leaving the promised land, trusting you, Lord, and we are fleeing to do it our own way in Moab, okay? And it was awful. And in fact, as he went there, what happened in Moab is that there were 10 years of heartache that followed. Okay, in Moab, God said Moab is so evil, it's so terrible that, that no one to the 10th generation that's a Moabite can ever even enter the sanctuary of the living God. Stay away from Moab. This guy goes to Moab, 10 years of heartache follow. You remember what happened? 10 years of heartache, ready? Malon and Kilion, the two boys, they intermarried with Moabite wives, all right? Nobody could have children, and then... Elimelech died, Malon died, Kilion died, and suddenly you've got Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws named Ruth and Orpah, and they are widows, okay? They have no husbands, they have no provision, they have no family, they have no food, they have no hope, okay? And it is just heartache, all right? And then look at verse 6. The story turns. The story turns in verse 6. When Naomi hears, the Lord has visited his people and given them food. And suddenly Naomi is like, wait, the Lord has visited. We're going back. And you remember what happens? They get up and they start to go back. And even that return is kind of filled with some heartache because she starts to go. And her two daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Orpah, are like, we're going too. And Naomi is like, no. Actually, we got nothing. Like, there's, there's no hope, no food, no family. Stay back. And the daughter-in-laws are like, no, we're going with you, Naomi. And Naomi, for a second time, says, no, you don't understand. There is no family. There is no food. Go back to your husband's homes. Like, like there you have somewhat hope. And you remember what happens? Remember? Orpah. And Ruth, Orpah is like, okay, I see the situation. And she kissed her mother-in-law goodbye and said, I'm going back to my safe life where at least I like know and can control a few things. Remember that? And we've said, we've said this each and every week. Don't be an Orpah, okay? Hope you have that written down somewhere. Don't be an Orpah. And then look at verse 14. I want to review probably the most important like paragraph in this whole book, verse 14 through following. Let me read it to you. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. In essence, here's what Ruth was saying. For better or for worse, sickness and in death, for richer, for poorer, like, like Naomi, I'm with you and your God. Your God will be my God. And she clung to Naomi, okay? She said, I'm clinging to you. This is like wedding covenant language. I will be one with you and your God. I'm with you. And so they go back. 
They go back to Bethlehem. And when they get back to Bethlehem, remember, like there was heartache even in the return. They get back to Bethlehem and everybody's like, what in the world is this Naomi 10 years ago? Naomi, and who is this foreigner Moabite? Like, can we even have a Moabite here? Like, what is happening? Who are you, Naomi? And Naomi says, verse 21, you can look at it. Naomi says, don't call me Naomi. And in this moment of like honest heartache, gripping real before the Lord, she goes this. And some of you may have said this before in your life. She says this. She's like, I don't feel the presence of the Lord Like, I think his hand is against me. Nothing makes sense in my life. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means the bitter one. That's my identity now. Call me bitter. In verse 22, next verse, God called her Naomi. He's like, even in the lowest moment, when you can't see me, even when you think your very identity has changed, even when you think there is no hope, but hope has been buried, God's like, I have not changed my view of you. Amen? That's how he sees us. God called her Naomi, all right? And the barley harvest began, but she felt like hope is buried. And I said this quote week one. I said this, even in times when we might think that we've been buried from God's perspective, we may be being planted, okay? Not buried, but planted, okay? She felt like hope was buried. Chapter 2, let's go there. Chapter 2, hope is sprouting, okay? Watch this. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz, okay? And so we just pause on that verse, and we go, huh, first of all, there's a man from the clan of Elimelech, meaning, wait a second, Naomi and Ruth actually have a little bit of extended family. Could that be part of the story? Secondly, he is a worthy man. And you remember, he's a worthy man, and that's a word of great character. Boaz has great character. You remember how Boaz greets his crew every day? Remember that from last week? He walks into his field, and like, this is an awesome CEO, president, dude, ready? He walks in, he's like, the Lord be with you. And, and everybody says, the Lord bless you. Wouldn't that be awesome to work for like a leader like that? The Lord be with you. Like, he's a worthy man. Everybody sees that, Okay. And he's also worthy because we know that when he looks out at the field, he looks around at the field, all of his workers, looks and sees Ruth in the background and goes, who is that? Translated, check her out. Who's, who's the girl? Remember, there's a love story. Who's the girl? And it wasn't just, remember last week, it wasn't just that she was the most like done up, Instagram post worthy, like, like selfie that looks perfect, kind of like, like done up in like, like she's looking awesome. It wasn't just dress beauty, like I said last week. It was field beauty, okay? He looked and he had heard, he had already heard that this woman, Ruth, was selfless, was caring, was a servant to Naomi, and he saw her character. He saw that she had been working all day, like, like muddy, sweaty, grimy, Humbly in the fields, he's like, there is a character that is deeper than her skin deep beauty. Who is that? And he looks and he sees that it's Ruth. By the way, the name Ruth means loyal friend, all right? And so Boaz does what young men, I'm turning this way, what young men, I'm calling you to do. When you see a woman in your life that is a loyal friend, that reflects the heart of God, that clings to the Lord, you do what Boaz did, all right? He crossed the field, he pursued her, he went to her to talk to her. That's what he did, okay? He went after her. And he comes up to Ruth and he's like, all right, this is how this is going to shake out now. I will provide for you. I will protect you. Don't go anywhere else. You stay in my field. My young men will watch you. I will provide for you. I will protect you. You who are called the loyal friend. Okay, I just, I just love that. And in verse 14, this is going to be important today, so I want you to see it. Verse 14, mealtime comes. 
And there's this big spread of food. There's like these people all over in verse 14. Watch this. In the middle of the mealtime party. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. In this beautiful scene, the owner of the field, like that highest ranking dude there, owner of the whole place, looks out and sees the foreigner who's from the land of like shame and past sin. Like nobody even like, like she's not even worthy to be in this room, is she? But the owner of the field says, you, I want you to actually come and I want you to eat at my table. I want you to be with me. I want to be with you. Take some bread, dip it in my wine. I want to be with you, which is a beautiful scene. Hold on to that for later. Hope is sprouting, okay? Hope is sprouting right here, all right? And he's like, guys, I want you to take care of her. And basically, Ruth leaves with an ephah, which we learned not last week, an ephah of grain, which means one day's wages was one to two little pounds of barley. She hoists up CrossFit style 50 pounds on her shoulders and goes back to Naomi. And Naomi is like, huh, what's his name? <laughs> like, like, this must be a guy. Who is the guy that has taken care of you? And verse 20, everybody look at that because this is, this is probably the second most significant verse in this entire book. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers, okay? Naomi says, may he be blessed by the Lord, his kindness. And remember that word? It's the word hesed, which is one of the most significant words in the Bible. It's a word which means the love of God, something like the unchanging, sacrificial, merciful, grace-filled, eternal, like love of God, the hesed love of God. And, and interestingly enough in the text, it's like, wait a second, is Boaz showing God's love or is God showing hesed love? And we're like, oh, it's both. Boaz is receiving it and reflecting it. Boaz is overflow of the hesed love of God and he's like, let me show the Hesed love of God. Hold on to that for later, okay? And Naomi says, this man is one of our redeemers. Remember what the word redeemer means? One of the most important words in the Bible. Redeemer is when someone is willing to pay a price to buy back that which is lost. When someone is willing to sacrificially pay a price to buy back that which is something in bondage and needs to be set free. A redeemer is one that says, I'll pay the price and I will provide, I will protect. Naomi is like, this might be one of our redeemers. Hope is sprouting, okay? Look at chapter three. If hope is sprouting, hope is growing, okay? Chapter three, verse one. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? In Hebrew, that is the rest of marriage. Ultimately, Naomi is saying, It's time we go after this man for you. And then if you remember last week, like, turned the temperature up just a little bit, got a little steamy. Naomi's like, here's the plan. Here's what I want you to do. Okay? Tonight is the harvest. The men will be like eating, drinking, getting merry, celebrating, doing the harvest. You go, and Ruth, I want you to clean yourself up, take a shower, anoint yourself with all your like feminine charm, whatever that means, blah, blah, blah. I want you to do that, Ruth. I want you to sneak into the party. You watch where Boaz eats, drinks, and when he lays down to go to sleep, this is what I want you to do. I want you to sneak in, lay at his feet, pull off his covers, lay at his feet. When he wakes up, he'll tell you what to do. To which I would have been like, Mom, like that's that that's the best plan you got? Like, like I thought that I thought the I thought the field girl like get invited to his table strategy was going well. And ultimately she's like, 
Ain't nobody got time for that. We are going in like, like fast gear. You sneak in, take off his covers, lay at his feet. And I, for some reason, Ruth is like, okay, I'll do it. And she does, okay? And Ruth, that day, like showers, cleans, cloak, anointing, whatever, goes to the party, watches, makes sure she doesn't go to the wrong guy, watches, watches where he lays down, falls asleep, sneaks up, takes off his covers, lays at his feet. He wakes up and he's like, who are you? She goes, I am your servant. And that, that Hebrew word for servant is not servant like field servant. It's servant like eligible bachelorette servant. And she says, why don't you spread your wings over me for you are a redeemer, meaning I've seen you provide for me. I've seen you protect me. Now, O oh Boaz, will you pay a price to buy back that which is lost? Boaz, ready? We looked at this last week. Will you marry me? Crazy scene. Like, like every social sector is flipped upside down. That, that is servant to master, female to male, Moabite to Israelite, and yet bold Ruth is like, will you marry me? And Boaz looks back at her and says, yes. But there's actually a redeemer closer than me. So once you go to sleep, Ruth, in the morning, we'll settle this. Either he will be your husband or I will be your husband. Once you go back to sleep, Ruth, tomorrow you will be married. To which we kind of left last week thinking, how would any woman sleep in that moment? Like the next day she becomes a wife. Um, and that's where chapter 4 begins, okay? If hope was buried and hope was sprouting and hope was growing... Today, we're going to see hope bloom, okay? So is everybody with me? Chapter 4, verses 1 and following, and we'll finish the book. Here we go. Chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friends, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Then he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. Okay, let's pause. All right? Boaz went to the city gates. In the ancient world, the city gates were a big deal. Okay? The city gates is where legal matters took place. The city gates symbolized authority. Okay? Big important decision, anything important happened? It happened at the city gates. That's why... Some of you might remember the story of Samson. Remember Samson wanted to make a statement? What did he do? He ripped up the city gates, and he took them, all right? Or you remember the quote of Jesus when he's like, I will build my church, and, anybody want to finish that? The gates of hell will not stand against my church. City gates meant authority. Boaz goes to the city gates and the Redeemer, notice it doesn't even say his name. It's like it's not even important to the story. The Redeemer comes walking by, and he's like, why don't you sit with me at the gates, my friend? He's like, hold on a second. He got 10 elders, and he brings 10 elders. He's like, something's about to go down. A major decision's about to happen at the city gates. And then he says, in kind of this legal courtroom sense, by the way, Naomi has come back. We are the Redeemers. You're the closest one. There is land that is available for you to buy, which, by the way, it was like a great opportunity right there. Like an ancient world, you didn't really pass down money. You passed down land, and land was everything. He's like, do you want to buy some land? Okay? And so collectively, we the readers should pause. Like, this guy says yes, and our 
love story of sweet Ruth and Boaz goes very bad. Let's look what he says. Watch this. Verse 5. Verse 4. Tell me that I would know, that I may know, for there's no one beside you to redeem it, and I come after you. Pause, ready? And he said, I will redeem it. And we all gasp. And then Boaz, Boaz gives a little asterisk. Boaz gives a little clause to the contract. Boaz says, time out, there's something that you need to know. Watch this. Verse 5, then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it, okay? Boaz is like, I know you want to buy this land, but let's be clear. The moment you buy this land, you also get a wife. You get Ruth the Moabite, and it becomes your responsibility to provide Ruth with children, to have a son, and one day that son will inherit the land. So you buy the land, you get a wife, and one day you give it back to his son, and the guy's like, okay, I don't want to do that. Why don't you redeem it. And in our little love story that we've been talking about for the last six weeks, the music starts to play. And here we go. Ready? Verse 7 through 8. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Apparently in Israel, uh, you didn't like have a handshake or contract. You pulled off your Birkenstock and you're like, let's get this deal done. And that's what they did. They pulled off their sandal and they're like, let it be seen now. In the midst of the elders, in the midst of the city gates, that a contract is about to happen. A covenant is about to happen. Verse 9, then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi and all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Kilion and Malon. Also, Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers And from the gate of his native place, you are witnesses of this day. Then watch how the people respond. Then all the people who are at the gate of the elders said, we're witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Epathra and be renowned in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. Don't miss this, all right? Boaz is like the woman who is a Moabite, the woman who is a foreigner from the land of shame, from the land of sin. Let it be known and seen today that with this price, I'm buying her freedom. Her identity has changed. She was once a Moabite far from God, Now she's part of the people of God. I redeem her. She was once lost, now she's found. She is part of my family, and she is part of the family of the people of God. Remember that for later. And the people are like, may there be blessing. Like, like, may the name be perpetuated. May you be blessed. Okay, look at verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. And let me just pause on that. I love that verse. The Lord gave her conception. Okay. Remember the two great problems of this story? Like the widows, they had no provision. 
They had no connection. They had no food. They had no family. And there are two bold verses in this book that shows when the Lord shows up and provides. And here's what the Lord provided. Remember the first one? The Lord visited his people and provided food. Second one, the Lord gave her conception. And I just want to say this. It's the Lord that provides our deepest needs, okay? Even when things don't make sense, even when the story seems like, Lord, what are you doing? I don't know. Like, I understand your plan, but not your pace. I don't understand your time. I don't. It's the Lord, the sovereign God of the universe, who provides our deepest needs, okay? The Lord gave her conception. And then the spotlight kind of turns to Naomi. The, the camera lens shifts to Naomi. And look at verse 14 and following. Then the woman said to Naomi, remember Naomi, the bitter one. Remember Naomi, the one who was destitute. Remember Naomi who was like, call me Mara. I went away full, now I'm empty. Remember Naomi? Watch what God has in store for Naomi. Watch this. The women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. May his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is more to you than seven sons and has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. Okay, let me just go deep biblically for a moment, okay? Up to this point, um, the word redeemer has been used for God. Up to this point, in the story of the Bible, the word redeemer has been used for adults who like buy and set free. But something shifts right now in this text. It says, yeah, yeah, the baby will be a redeemer and a restorer of life. And for those of you who are familiar with the Bible, and let me use a big word here, ready? The meta narrative of the Bible, the big picture of the Bible, that everything in the Old Testament whispers and symbolizes and, and points and foreshadows the big picture story of God. God just wants to drop a little truth here and say, watch this. There's a baby born in Bethlehem who will be a redeemer and a restorer of life. A baby born in Bethlehem. And he will be a redeemer and a restorer of life. Hold on to that for a moment. And Naomi, the, the bitter one, is now blessed. Naomi, the empty one, is now full. And our story closes with Naomi, like sitting there, a grandmother, playing with a little redeemer on her lap. End of story. Okay, But the book of Ruth closes in a really interesting way. Um, one of my favorite pastors, uh, David Platt, he pointed this out, um, that it's like the story ends, but then as the credits are rolling, it's almost like a Marvel movie. Did anybody know like the Marvel movies where it's like story ends, credits close, you're getting up, and then, oh, wait a second. There's a little, like, post scene, like something else is happening at this point into the future. I see about half the crowd nodding and half the crowd like, what? What are you doing? Like, like trust me, Marvel movie. That's what happens. Okay? And there's a little post-credit Marvel movie scene here that at first glance is like a genealogy. What could be important about a genealogy? Like, like why is this even significant? It sounds boring. Hang with me. Watch this. Verse 17. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And you just pause and you say, Wait, what? Israel, like David? Like the greatest king of Israel was, was David. He was, he was the shepherd warrior king. He was the shepherd who shepherded sheep. He was the warrior who won the great battle, took down Goliath, brought freedom to his people. He was the king up to this point in the old time, considered greatest king of Israel. And what this is saying is, hey, clue in for a moment. 
this is the story of how King David came to be. And then look, we got genealogy again. Watch this, verse 18 and following. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. David, the one who offered the sacrifices in the presence of the sanctuary of God. Well, I didn't list all these names. I don't know if any of you are kind of mathed out, but if you were counting, there were 10 generations there. What's significant about that? Remember, no Moabite may enter the presence of the Lord to the 10th generation. It's like, this is the story of David the king, and if you know the Bible... If you know what happened, there was a moment in 2 Samuel chapter 7 where David is like, hey, I live in an awesome house. God's dwelling in a tent. God, I want to build you a house. And God said, no, David, you're not the one to do it. But let me make you a promise, David. You will not build my house, but I will build your household. And out of your generations, there will come a king who is like you, but greater than you. You are a shepherd warrior king. You shepherd sheep. One day from your line, David, I'm sending someone who will be the good shepherd of my people. One day I'm sending someone, David, who will be a warrior, not just kill Goliath, but he will win the battle against sin, hell, death, and Satan. He will be the ultimate warrior. And David... You are a king, but one day from your line, I'm sending a king who will be the king of kings, the high king of heaven, because one day there will be a baby born in Bethlehem who will be a redeemer, who will restore life, and his name is Jesus. Are you telling me, please don't miss this, are you telling me that God can use a Moabite foreigner past of sin and shame who says, I will cling to you, Lord. I will trust you in the middle of the mystery. You can have my life. And God will use her yes to bring out this micro story to shout out the redemption of the world. Yes, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. God is looking for our yes. He's looking for those who will say, I cling to you, I love you, and even if my story doesn't make sense, my micro story can be merged into the great big story of God, and you have no idea what God can do with a life if he has your yes. Amen? So I'm going to close this with, with five applications to say, what does this teach about God? What does this teach about us? I'm going to briefly give us Five things, okay? Um, maybe you want to write this down. Maybe one of them will zing you and you want to write this down, okay? What does this show us about God, this story? What does it show us about us? Number one, um, I already said it, but I'll say it again. In this story, there's a baby born in Bethlehem named Obed who would be a redeemer and a restorer of life. There was a baby named Jesus born in Bethlehem who's the redeemer and the restorer of life, okay? Jesus redeems. Do you know that? You've heard forever, Jesus loves you, but do you know that he loves you with a redeeming love? What does that mean? I've said it all six weeks. What does it mean to redeem? It means there is someone who is willing to pay a price for you. There is someone willing to say, I will protect you. I will provide you. I will love you with a redeeming love. And I think God just wants some of you to rest in that. Like that Jesus loves you enough to pay the price to set you free, to win back that which was lost. He loves you with a redeeming love. That's good news. That's good news. And he's a restorer of life. Do you know that Jesus said, I have come that they would have life and have it abundantly. All right? There's all kinds of facades of things that will satisfy and bring false life. Only Jesus is like, I actually want to restore real life. All right? That's the story. Application number two. God loves to take people who are far from him, full of shame, out of hope, and make them a part of his family. Okay? Ruth was a Moabite, full of sin, full of shame, full of backstory. God's like, I actually want to change your identity and make you part of my family. Look at me. You are never too far from God. I don't care what you've done. I don't care your past. 
I don't care if you look in your backstory and you say, do you know how much I've messed up? Do you know how sinful I was? God is in the business of redeeming people out of Moab into his family, okay? You are never too far from God. Don't believe that lie. I have friends that live in Lebanon right now. I can picture their faces that are believing the lie, that are saying, I can't be a part of your church, Newman, because I've screwed up too much in my past. God will never forgive me. That is not true. It's not true. He loves to take people from Moab and bring them back into redeeming love. Application three. God wants us to receive and reflect has said love. Look back at chapter 2, verse 20. I want to just hang there for one minute. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose hesed has not forsaken the living and the dead. Okay, and remember we said, wait, hesed, who is this God? Is it Boaz? We said it's both, okay? Boaz was one who received the hesed of the Lord. Boaz was one that reflected the hesed of the Lord. And I want to challenge you to something, Okay. This is something that we're growing in as a church, okay? We are a biblically strong, knowledge-filled church. And it's not enough just to say the hesed of God, the, the unending, sacrificial, eternal, mercy-filled, write it in your notebook like, woohoo, the hesed of God, I get it now, okay? Boaz not only received it, he reflected it, Okay? And so how did Boaz reflect it? He saw somebody in his life who was destitute, who needed help, who needed rescue, who needed mercy, and he's like, I'm going to be a vessel of showing that to someone else, okay? You remember the verse that said, the Lord visited the people. The Lord visited the people and gave them food, okay? Do you think visited was just like, hey there, I'm visiting you, or do you think it was something deeper? Please say deeper. It was deeper, okay? It was like, I'm showing Hesed love to you. There's a verse in James uh, chapter 1, verse 27. Let me read it to you. And I hope one word just jumps up. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Okay, I want to ask you, is there something that God is calling you to is there something that God is calling, like, is there someone that God is calling you to visit like the Lord would visit to show has said love, to reflect his love? What would you do this week if you were to say, who in my life am I called to show has said to? Okay? Respond to the Lord. Okay? Two more. Number four. God is looking for sons and daughters that will cling to him in the midst of the mystery, okay? Orpah counted the cost, saw the mystery, saw the unknown, saw the potential pain, kissed it goodbye, and said, I'm going back to my life. And you know what? None of you before this series, I doubt, has ever heard of Orpah. Orpa, have you? All right? Maybe one nod, shaking head, but other than that, nobody's ever heard of Orpah, Right? Because she clung to her life, and ultimately she lost it. Ruth said, I'm clinging to you, Lord. I'm, in essence, sacrificing like the knowns of my life. And her life multiplied to the point that the great story of redemption went through her. And I just want to tell you, I don't know if any of you, in fact, I do know that many of you are in a moment of life that there's some mystery right now. Am I right? Moment of life where I don't understand you, God. Moment of life where, God, you might feel distant from me. Moment of life where I'm not living in blessing. I'm living in, yeah, pretty close to bitter maybe even. Like I, like I don't know what you're doing, God. I just want to exhort you with the weight of God's word. In those moments, cling to the Lord in the midst of the mystery. Okay. It's the Lord who is good, and he, he just takes great honor when we cling to him. He's working all things out. Let me read you Romans 8, 28 through 29. A friend called me this week and gave me this verse because he was clinging to it for his own life. This is what he said. We know that for those who love God, 
all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He's working all things for his good. But can I tell you something? That doesn't mean like good like we might initially define it. It's not just like happy, fluffy, positive mindset, good. If I trust you, everything's going to feel good. You want to know what's good? He defines it with the next verse. All things will work according to the good to be conformed to Christ. Was Christ falsely accused? Yes. Was Christ beat up and like misunderstood? Yes. Did Christ lay down his life? Yes. He wants us to be conformed to Christ. And there will be times when things don't make sense, when we're falsely accused, when we don't understand, when we're like in struggling tough times and God is like, I'm making you look like Jesus. Is God good and faithful? Yes, he is. Is God sovereign and does he reign over every situation? Yes, he does. And he will work everything out for his highest glory and his people's ultimate good. Okay? Can I give you one final application? And then we will worship and we'll take communion. I want you to look back. Um, I want you to look back in one of the most beautiful scenes in this Bible. Okay? It's in verse 14 uh, of chapter 2. And I want you just to picture this scene, okay? They're at mealtime. And there is Boaz the owner of the field, the highest ranking person in the whole place. And he looks out and he sees Ruth. She's like Moabite, like bad reputation, like, like far for like, and he says, I actually want to be with you. I want to dwell with you. I want you to be with me. Come dip your bread in my wine. I want to be with you. And can I tell you something? Um, the king of the universe is looking out at each of us. And he's saying this. If you were to take one image from the book of Ruth, this is the one I want you to take. The king of the universe is looking out at each of us and saying, I love you and I want to be with you. I want you. Does this sound like communion? Ready? To dip bread in my wine. I'm the king and I love you with a hesed love and I want to be with you. Usually at the start of a sermon, I give you my title. I'm going to give it to you at the end. Here's the title of the sermon. I am Ruth. Your name is Ruth, biblically. God loves you. He's looking for sons and daughters. He's calling you out in the middle of the party and saying, come and be with me. Like I treasure you and I want to be with you. You. So, worship team, would you come on up? Um, and we're going to close. We're going to close uh, this service, I think, in a very significant way. Okay, so I'm going to ask first of all, elders and those who have committed to serve, would you make your way to that corner and you are going to take um, a plate of bread and you're going to take a cup of wine? Okay. And we're going to have six different stations um, across the back here. And we are going to close with communion. Look at me, everybody. Ready? Ruth and Boaz style, okay? I want you to spend a little bit of time with the Lord. I want you to commune with the Lord. I want you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I want you to rest in his hesed love that loves you and wants to be with you. And just like Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. We're going to take bread and we're going to dip it in this juice. And it's going to be the symbol of a king who loves you and wants to be with you. Okay? Spend some time before the Lord. Humble yourself. Ask him if he wants to reveal anything to you. Um, and then would you guys, yeah, would you spread out in the back? And then, and then also we're going to close like this. Um, the Lord says, sing to me a new song. Um, and I just love that our, our worship team, specifically uh, the other night, uh, the Lord just put these lyrics on Lauren's heart that just captures the book of Ruth. And she's like, I think there's a new song bubbling up in me. And, uh, and Lauren and Abram, they, they, they kind of wrote this new song that we're going to sing. 
okay? We're going to sing a new song to the Lord. We're going to sing of the Hesed love of God. We're going to sing of him calling us to him, okay? And so here's what I'd love for us to do. They're going to sing this song um, over us, and we're going to respond with joy. So let's do it like this. Spend some time before the Lord as they play in the background. When the moment's right, come on up. Go to one of these stations and take communion. And then as you you sit down, we're going to stand together and they're going to sing this song over us. And we're going to sing it with them. Let Let me pray for us. Jesus, we love you. Thank you that you are our Boaz. Thank you that you love us with a redeeming love. Thank you that your grace, your hesed is sufficient for us. Lord, I pray that we would rest in that. I pray that we would live in that. God, I pray that our hearts and our lives would just rejoice in who you are, our Boaz. We love you, Jesus. Even in these quiet moments, God, would you meet with us? Would you reveal anything in our lives that's not pleasing to you that we can confess and repent right now? And would you let us rejoice in the fact that you are the king calling us to your table? We get to be with you. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.